solar, I think, is is, is undergoing this sort of remarkable uh, uh, decline in the cost of production, but it doesn't have nearly the the share that wind does, right? Is that is this sort of where solar is at right now? Well, let me put this in perspective. If you talk about the photovoltaic cell, that right, converts sunlight into electricity. The first commercial use of that was in 1954. Bell Labs used solar cells to power telephone repeater stations. Huh. And at the time, it was it was it was astro literally astronomical in cost. And it had not been for the space race with the Soviets, where we needed to put satellites in space, we needed a source of power for these satellites. So, so, so NASA turned to solar cells as a source of power for the satellites. But at the time, they cost literally hundreds of dollars per watt. NASA didn't care. Right, it's, it's NASA. It's NASA. <laughs> but over the last Shout few out decades, to Alabama. <laughs> the, the cost of, of solar cells has come down and down and down. The efficiency, the conversion efficiency, has continued to go up and up and up. Right, and now you've got solar cells that are being produced for under a dollar a watt. Just in the last few years, they've come down Can by I a factor of three, thanks mostly to the Chinese, which have ramped up production. Maybe Usually. 50% of numbers. Chinese subsidies. Yeah, let's, let's the numbers mentioned. around this. The price of solar panels have come down 46% since the first, first quarter of 2010. That's crazy. And that, that, yeah, it's that, incredible. That's amazing. And I, I'm glad that you keyed up this international discussion because that's that, there's there's a lot of exciting stuff happening internationally, and I think it's important for Americans to hear that like this can be done, that, that it doesn't have to be this sort of after thought welfare case that actually you can it can actually be integrated into um, how a nation gets its power so more on that after this break Ask me. Um, in Germany right now there's been a, a, a real revolutionary transformation of the grid there um, I have some video looking what this, what the kind of new German energy future or present looks like. You got times when half the power in Germany is being produced by renewables. You have a tremendous explosion of wind and solar um, generation. How did this happen, Dave? How did it, how did Germany? Under, begin to undertake this. It's, it, it's a really fascinating story. The, the, the German law um, doesn't cost, this is worth saying, it doesn't cost the government any money. Rate, electricity rate payers pay an extra fee to subsidize people who install uh, solar or wind. And people who install solar and wind are guaranteed <coughs> a higher than market rate of return hmm. for something like a decade. These are called feed-in tariffs in keeping with Green's, uh, you know, aptitude for great terminology. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, Screw it. Tomorrow we're doing an hour on feed and tariff. Feed and tariff. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I, I had dinner with the with the parliamentarian in Germany who who got this passed, Hans jo Joseph Fell, uh, last year, and I asked him. I was like, this this one law is like a lever that is transforming one of the biggest industrial economies in the world. How in the world did you make this happen? You know, especially relative to the frozen politics in the U.S. And he's like, well, we passed it in 2000, and everybody laughed at me. Everybody thought it was this trivial thing. Everybody thought, y you know, it's not going to make a material difference to anything. And so they just didn't pay attention. That's like the big utilities in Germany are just as opposed as sure. our big utilities are. But they sort of snuck this thing in, and it's just ratcheted its way up to, to forcing Germany to make these big systems. So decisions. it's basically it's basically for the person that wants to have a wind turbine or a solar panel, it's giving them the, the, the incentives and guaranteeing a certain and, and, return. And certainty. A yes. certainty, right? Yes. Like if I put this in, and is that the reason? Like I love, I, I ask myself, I, I remember um, being in Turkey, okay? And looking, you know, you're driving through a town of 50,000 in, in the middle of Turkey, in the center of Turkey, and every single water heater is a solar power water heater. And just thinking to myself, why isn't that the case in California or Arizona? Like, if this is not some super sophisticated technology, this is a place that per capita GDP is way lower than the U.S. I'm not in some cosmopolitan high-tech center. I'm in the middle of a town in Turkey. And yet, there's every single water heater is solar powered. Why is it not the case that we have this, that we have more deployment like that in the U.S.? I wish I could answer that. <laughs> yeah, so a couple of a couple of points there. In terms of um, solar hot water heating specifically, which is such a simple solar technology, we actually have a lot of uh, natural gas water heaters in this country, which are very efficient. Right. So I think solar hot water heaters are a great idea, um, but I think uh, that natural gas, if that's what you've got, if you've got a tank with hot water. It's already it's doing it fairly efficiently. Very efficient. Right. Um, in terms of solar PV technology, it's growing very quickly in the U.S., and I think we've, we've touched a little bit on the fall in 
prices, which of course has pushed you know the adoption. Another uh, big factor are the number of, um, of different products that solar companies are offering. You know, you asked why don't more people do it? Well, it's hard to pay for something up front that you're going to use yep. over 25 years. Yep. Um, but when a company like Solar City, that I think is going to have a very successful IPO uh, next couple of weeks, if they say you don't have to pay any more than what you're paying currently for solar, um, and we'll take care of everything. All you have to do is you know give us the, you know, the the real property on your roof. I think that has a huge. That's and many companies and that, like that doing that. That's a great example of how most of this now is being driven by private dollars, your dollars, my dollars, various businesses' dollars. You know, Dave, I was thinking when you're talking about feed-in tariffs. Well, geez, is there something about solar that it needed that special price guarantee? If you look back six, six decades in the United States, not only were prices guaranteed for the big conventional power plants hmm. that were built, but each company got a monopoly guaranteed right. market share. Right. That's how those, how those plants got built. Today, with solar and renewables, it's right. mostly private dollars driving That's that industry. Uh, another thing that Shalini uh, brings up is, you know, with the with the price of panels being so low now, basically being commoditized, it's it's it's, it's a cheap commodity now. The differences in solar prices between uh, installed solar in the U.S. and the installed solar in, say, Germany, are what's called soft costs, which are things like acquiring customers, installing, right. maintenance, and financing, which is a huge, huge piece. And the U.S. is just sort of getting in that game of soft costs. And, and in Germany, you know, those, those costs are tiny relative to the U.S. So there's lots of room there to, to yeah. move. I'd just like to pick up on, on your mentioning of, of finance because it is so critical when you talk about solar electricity. You know, f solar panels um, are warrantied for 25 years, right? So they're going to generate power reliably for decades to come. And, you know, if, if somebody asked me to pay for, for, you know, three decades of electricity, at, you know, through my utility bill, I'd have a hard time. Right, right? exactly. But that's, because, that's what you're effectively asking folks. When you ask them to when, buy, right. So, so financing is absolutely critical to enable users of solar systems to pay for these systems over time. We've talked about the U.S. and we've talked about what's happening in Germany, which is a sort of one path forward. The, from, the, from the climate perspective, the single most important thing is what happens in the pathway of development of those places that are not very energy intensive right now as they become energy intensive and do they go the pathway of clean and renewable energy or do they go the pathway of essentially diesel burners and coal because if they do the latter we're basically screwed and Bob you 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 run an incredible nonprofit that works on electrifying places that don't have electricity with solar I want you to talk about the work you do because I think it's really remarkable right after this break So we're sitting here in a very well-lit studio on the grid in uh, one of the wealthiest cities in the world, New York City, um, where we take energy for granted. But, but Bob, there are what 1.5 billion people uh, on this planet who do, who do not have reliable uh, access to electricity, and they should. <laughs> and the question is, are they going to? How how is that electrification going to happen? Tell me what your organization does. Sure, the Solar Electric Light Fund, or SELF, is a nonprofit organization founded in 1990. So. Uh, for the last two decades, we've been bringing solar uh, electricity to rural and remote villages in the developing world, places that have never been connected to a, a conventional power line and aren't likely to be connected any time in the, in the foreseeable future. You mentioned reliable electricity. These folks have zero electricity, right, right. right? And so basically, what does that mean? The sun goes down, these folks retreat into homes that are lit dimly, if at all, by uh, candles or smoky, polluting kerosene lanterns, right? and uh, children aren't able to read or study at night. They have to breathe in the kerosene fumes, which are toxic. Mm -hmm. 1.5 million people die every year from indoor air pollution, right? Um, there's basically nothing they can do to lift themselves out of poverty. They are condemned to live their lives in, in, in utter darkness. Uh, no way to pump water, no, no way to refrigerate vaccines, no way to deliver a baby at night, no way to communicate with the outside world, right? So energy poverty, undermines every attempt of these people to achieve a better life for themselves. And the, the question, as you, as you pointed out, is how are, uh, how are these people going to emerge 
from centuries of darkness into a brighter future is a critical question. Are they going to rely on fossil fuels and centralized power sources? Well, the fact is it costs up to $20,000 a mile to extend a grid to these rural wow. villages, very dispersed population. So it's not economic to do so. Um, they could fire up a diesel generator, right? Which is what a lot of places do do. Absent the grid, they, they turn to diesel generators. We're working with a group called Partners in Health. Uh, well-known uh, organization out of Boston delivering health care to the poorest of the poor, initially in Haiti, later in Lesotho, uh, Rwanda, right. Malawi. Um, they had been using diesel generators because they had no choice to power their hospital, right? We turned to them and said there's a better way. It will cost more up front with a solar solution, but over time they're actually saving money, lots of money. And so it's, it's not just a more sustainable way to go. Economically, it's a smarter way. Um, I want to show this a little bit of uh, a video about uh, a project of yours in West Africa, uh, because it, it, it's not just the, the power and lights, it, it actually undergirds a whole sort of revolution in irrigation. Take a look. Thanks to irrigation, the production has been multiplied by 10. The crops are more varied, and today, maize, tomatoes, or even salad grow here. <laughs> Je suis toujours au jardin. On, on dit comment, comment le soleil peut faire ça On ne savait pas. On vend et on mange. Et nous mangeons beaucoup ici. <laughs> These women can now feed their families all year round, but also earn money and rise from poverty by selling their crops on the markets. Commerce has appeared thanks to solar power, a first step towards development. You and I met a few years ago, and you, you told me about this project, and I just, I feel like it should, you should have a budget of a, a billion dollars. I, I, I'm, I'm serious, because it does seem to me like this is, you know, we have a, it's such a, a crazy conversation about energy in this country, in this world, in which, and I know this, in this country, people who are extremely poor, and I, I know a lot of folks that work among populations that are extremely poor, your energy bill is a big part of your disposable income, right? So we're talking about cheap energy, and for people that are relatively affluent, it's like this afterthought about your cable bill is eating much more than your energy bill but when you don't have a lot of money energy costs are, are are extremely important and so there's this huge desk disconnect at the top of the social pyramid the bottom of the social pyramid both in this country and globally about how we think about energy and its price and we can have a, a, a system that's both equitable and also sustainable yeah and, and one connection I wanted to draw with this work is you know you're working about bringing solar power to people who are in very austere conditions but there are other people who are working in austere conditions right now who are also looking to solar, and that's the U.S. military. I did a story last year on uh, on, the, on the Marines who are out in these forward bases in Afghanistan. Off the grid as well. Hold, hold that grid. thought, because we've got some great video of that as well, and I want to play that and talk about what the, the Department of Defense is doing on this right after this. The experimental solar panel is designed to power a small military operations center. It's called the Green System, which stands for the Ground Renewable Expeditionary Energy Network System. It will generate up to 1,700 watts of uh, pure energy into the controller system. Uh, the controller system will then take that and put it into what's called a high-energy lithium battery. That's a, a, a publicity clip from the Department of Defense <laughs> about, um, about one of these green projects they've been, they've been deploying. Yeah, and, and I, I talked to some Marines about this. Not one of them mentioned greenhouse gases. Right. Every one of them loves these things because it's just purely a, a utility for them. It's purely an advantage for them. And, and the connection I was going to make is they're working in austere conditions out there on the front lines in Afghanistan. But if we're right about climate change, you know, post-Sandy New York is another set of austere conditions. There's going to be a lot more conditions in the world where you need portable, self-contained uh, 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 electricity generation. Well, I think another driver for Department of Defense, their interest in renewable energy isn't just the green, it's also concerns about cybersecurity. And I think uh, installations want the ability to island their systems mm -hmm. so that in case of an attack, they're not completely down. Right, and this sort of resilience question gets gets to the work that you're doing in, in places that haven't had electricity, right? Which is that the, uh, I, I said this earlier in the show, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a remarkable thing how, how, how much you take electricity for granted and then when it goes away, you realize that everything about your life is entirely <laughs> dependent on that. Um, and, and so this, the, 
I guess my question would be, if you if you put a solar panel in, in, in a village that hasn't had electricity, what happens if six months from now it breaks or there's a problem with it? I mean, it seems like this could be a recipe for um, this kind of brief period, <laughs> this brief renaissance and then going back in. Right. Well, the solar panel's not likely to break, but what you do need to, to take care of is, is long-term maintenance with the battery if you're using batteries to store electricity. Uh, there are some applications, such as solar water pumping, uh, which do not require batteries. In this case, you're using the sun's energy to pump water to a reservoir uh -huh. and you're letting gravity do the rest, which is exactly what we were using uh, with, the, with the project in Benin. If I could just uh, yeah, please. quickly uh, you know, elaborate a little bit on that project because it's, it's pretty remarkable how far a little bit of energy goes. In this case, we were asked to go in and provide power for an entire community. And we've developed this whole village model where we're using electricity for lights at home, but also for the clinic, the school, for street lighting, right, for water pumping, for micro enterprise, and even wireless communications. Now, in, in this particular village, when we did a needs assessment, what became clear was their number one concern was food security. Because during the six month dry season, which runs from November through April, there's no, no food production, no rain, and malnutrition is widespread. So we simply combine solar water pumping, pumping water from an underground aquifer, or in some cases a, a river, and, and pumping that water to a, a reservoir and then feeding a drip, irriga drip irrigation system, right, which is allowing these women farmers that we're working with to grow high value fruits and vegetables year round. Wow. So you go back to this village and they're well fed, really they're also earning income, with the produce they're selling to the market. So suddenly we have a model that's not only providing access to energy, but water and food and income and women's empowerment. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, when you think about telephones, the developing world kind of leapfrogged yeah, yeah, yeah. the U.S. in terms of the poles and wires to yeah. mobile. Yeah. Do you see the same thing potentially in energy? Well, it's exactly what we're doing. These, the, these folks that we're That's working with in That's Africa really have gone straight to 21st century technology, right. wireless power, right? right? They're, they're bypassing uh, in, uh, high transmission distribution lines. You don't need to run these transmission lines to the villages. Wherever the sun shines, you can capture those photons and generate power for just about everything you, you need in a sustainable, carbon-free way. And it's, and it's, it's, it's worth emphasizing that if, the, if they go the other way, if right. they go the central fossil fuel generation and big transmission line model in the developing world, we are toast. Right. Right. Well, and, it's and, and it's also, and there's also, I mean, there's also cost to even if you don't do that. These, um, the, the kerosene that you talked about and diesel generators and even wood stoves, which there's a whole literature now about wood stoves and, and the environmental havoc that wood stoves are wreaking. And um, so there's there's a lot of different ways that you can get power that aren't necessarily this huge distributed power system that are going to have some pretty intense environmental effects. I want to find out what my guests know now. They did not know at the beginning of the week. Kate McGinty. Well, thanks. Mine is a DOD piece and some good news. During the height of the election uh, campaign, in a partisan move, the House took out dollars from DOD's budget for energy efficiency and renewable energy. The good news is post-election, it's restored. That's important. DOD is the biggest consumer of energy, so great market for renewables and efficiency. Second, DOD's become a great driver of innovation in energy technology, just like DARPA did on the internet. And I think the last one is something that Dave was touching on, the credibility of renewables. When you're talking security and DOD cares, it brings in a whole different perspective in furtherance of renewables and efficiency. Yeah, and obviously there's a tremendous amount of research dollars in the world of the Pentagon, as we saw with the development of DARPA and things like that. And a lot of times, technologies that begin as military technologies, GPS is the best example, right? Started as military technologies, then become broadly accessible to public, and the cost comes down. Absolutely, and we're back on track now, so good news. Bob. So last week, NASA released images from their uh, visible infrared imaging radiometer suite, a mouthful, but basically it's a satellite uh, using uh, high resolution visible and infrared uh, imaging to, to reveal the, the most detailed images of Earth at night that we've ever seen. And for me, that was uh, just another reminder of, of the reality in which we live where you have uh, 1.5 billion people without power. You look at Africa at night and you see it's basically a continent shrouded in dark. And to me, that, that's something that we, we keep needing to remind ourselves. Um, 
you know, for, for any of your viewers that uh, want to know what they can do to help bring light and help power. Help you get to that $1 billion budget. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and hope to the poorest people in the world, I, I would like to welcome them to visit our website, which is uh, self, S-E-L-F, dot org. Uh, a little bit goes a long way. For full disclosure, I always give to your organization every year, and I think it's an incredibly uh, worthy organization to give to, and, and folks should definitely check that out, self.org. Shalini. I learned that Rio Tinto, the big mining company, is using wind turbines for a diamond mine in northern Canada. <laughs> and they're doing it not for any kind of environmental reasons, but because it's the only reliable source of fuel there. So I think it points out there are many reasons to do renewables, and in a lot of contexts, they are the best the best source of electricity for people. And is that is that a situation like we were talking about before where you can basically just have power generation local and not have to be hooked up to the grid or not have to extend lines out, et cetera? It is, and I think it's important to point out that you know renewables can happen a lot of different ways. You can do what Bob is doing and have the solar panel on people's roofs, which is happening in the U.S. as well, or you can have the big power projects that are big wind turbines like what my company's done um, and, and others have done and big solar projects. So it really, uh, wind and solar can be either grid connected or standalone. It depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Dave. Uh, it, it's been taken for granted by politics watchers that the that at the federal level, climate politics is frozen. There's nothing right. going to come out of the federal government. Here. But it, it turns out not to be true. There's a provision of the Clean Air Act that Obama can use to reduce total U.S. carbon emissions 10% by 2020 with a stroke of his pen without permission from Congress. So he's got no excuse now. And if, and if people are looking for a place to focus their energy on trying to make something actually happen here, this is a tool that is laying on the table. And, uh, and right now, uh, the EPA is very nervous, for obvious reasons, about using it and could use some bucking up, I think. The EPA the is in the midst of a process internal about what, their, what rules are going to come out with. They've come out with some rules and others. The Supreme Court has authorized them to regulate carbon under the Clean Air Act. So they have that, they have that uh, legal authority. And NRDC has put out this report sketching out a way that they could go about doing it in a, in a, uh, plausible fashion that wouldn't be too disruptive. Yeah, and, and, if, and if you're interested in the details, I wrote it up at grist.org, which also deserves a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing around billions here. My thanks to Kathleen McGinty from the Sustainable Construction Company, Weston Solutions, Bob Freeling from the Solar Electric Life Fund, self.org, Shalini Ramanathan from the Wind Energy Company, RES Americas, and Dave Roberts from grist.org.